Well, welcome to West End Resilience Live. Today, we welcome Thomas Mostany, who's a Senior Vice President and Global Head of Product for Global Blue. He'll be looking at the consumer sentiment in key international markets with new research on when overseas visitors are likely to return and what they'll be expecting in a post-pandemic world. We are also welcoming Ewan Venters, who is Chief Executive of Fortner & Mason. He'll share his experience of reopening their store in Asia. This will be followed by an opportunity for you to put your questions to them both. But first, let's cross over to Jace Tyrrell, Chief Executive of New West End Company. Jace, over to you. Martin, thank you very much indeed. And welcome back, West Enders, our New West End Company members, our partners and our friends. Uh, of the West End with West End Resilience Live uh, with Microsoft. Uh, we are hoping, obviously, for better weather uh, as we start to reopen the West End next week uh, from Monday. Uh, we are days away uh, and a huge amount of work and preparations from the team at New West End Company to support you in your gradual reopening and obviously a lot of work uh, that all of our West End members and businesses are doing uh, for colleagues and for customers in preparation for coming back uh, on Monday next week. Uh, I just would like to do a brief shout out uh, for those that have been back in the West End the last couple of weeks. You will see the streets are lined with flags. Thank you, flags. And this really is a shout out to our heroes, uh, the great heroes across retail, uh, health, cleansing, security and other key frontline workers that have been operating and working right through this pandemic and will continue to work and operate as we come through into our reopening and recovery phase. And we would love for you to share your thanks on a very short video, which you can send. And there'll be some details uh, at the end of this webinar of how you can do that. And it really is a heartfelt thank from all of us at New West End Company on everything that you're doing, our key frontline partners uh, during the last 12 weeks and as we move through the weeks ahead. So today we're thinking about the resilience of our customer, uh, learning perhaps some insights on what's happened in other parts of the world, uh, what we can perhaps expect uh, in the West End, obviously not our international visitors initially, but certainly uh, they will start to come back in the months and into next year. And I'm hoping with Thomas and both with you and perhaps some forecasts and predictions of the immediate period and what we might expect in the next two, three uh, weeks ahead. So over to Thomas first to give us his insight and perspective from around the world. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for the invitation for uh, joining the event today. So, uh, for those of you who maybe have attended, uh, you know, conferences where myself or other uh, representatives from Global Blue have spoken, you have always seen that we are a very data-intensive company because out of our tax-free shopping business, we have, you know, always been happy to share trends around performance and what different nationalities are doing in different retail formats in different parts of the world. Today, clearly that information is not what I'm going to share with you because uh, as we are painfully aware, you know, uh, transactions in this moment are very limited, but we're still a very data oriented company. So what we are doing is trying to pull from our own research plus from information that we are collecting from different parts of the world, a little bit what the different phases of the recovery uh, are looking. So the way that we're structuring, and we, we will see that in the next uh, slide, uh, is basically we have divided our thinking and the way that we envision uh, uh, this uh, recovery to take place in basically five phases. Where the first one is where, uh, you know, the West End is probably going to start as of next week, where is a situation where borders are basically closed, so there are uh, only domestic uh, consumers, but uh, stores are reopening. And this is the situation that uh, has already taken place in China already for a couple of, uh, of uh, months, and we will share a little bit of data around that. But it, it has also been the case uh, in a number of uh, important cities in continental Europe, and we will try to get a look at, at that as well. Phase two is basically when uh, what we call inter-regional travel uh, starts. So if we think about Europe and if we think about London, this is where basically uh, uh, you, you will start receiving the travelers from uh, uh, from continental uh, from continental Europe. And if we think about our reality in Asia Pacific, is where traveling between, for example, China and Japan and China and Korea will start uh, taking place. 
we are uh, at the very beginning of something which looks like intra-regional in some parts of Europe, so we will also discuss around that. Then uh, what we call phase three is basically when long haul uh, flights will restart. So typically we think about uh, the UK as a destination. This is when we will uh, start seeing you know, numbers of travelers arriving from, from Americas, from uh, Asia Pacific in generally, and from, from the Middle East. And this today is a situation which we are not seeing uh, uh, still uh, anywhere in the world, but uh, this is where we are starting to survey consumers in order to understand what their intention is around traveler, uh, around traveling and uh, what they expect to find when they uh, are starting to take this uh, long haul flight. So what we will share here is a survey that we have just completed with uh, with over uh, 6,000 uh, Chinese consumers that were actively shopping in Europe uh, last year. So we have asked them a number of questions which we will share today in terms of what their expectations are, when will they will start traveling again and what they expect to find as they travel back. At one point, uh, uh, we expect the, 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 the pandemic to be over and we will gradually move into a phase of, let's say, normality or new normality. Uh, when exactly that will happen, I will not venture that because we don't have a crystal ball. But probably this is when we expect business to uh, recover and to be back at, let's say, 2019 level. So this is a little bit the way that we're framing our analysis and, of course, the way that we model this and the data that we collect and how we refine this model is something that we will continuously uh, uh, update because we, we think that the situation is evolving constantly and it is an important uh, good way to, to, to take uh, uh, preliminary data in order to be able to predict how things will be in the future. So if we move to the next slide, uh, uh, as I was mentioning before, this is a situation where uh, uh, basically, the UK will restart next week as the stores are opening. So, what can we uh, expect? And here we have taken two, uh, two data from basically two uh, places. One is uh, China, where, as you know, uh, provinces have reopened at different pace, but the situation uh, has become, let's say, normalized from a retail perspective way before uh, this has happened in Europe. And there, what we are seeing is that roughly after two months, uh, consumption is back to uh, more or less 80% of what it was in the pre-COVID uh, uh, period uh, in general across the retail sector. Of course, we know that there are some brands, particularly in the, in the, in the high-end luxury, that are having uh, performances which go even further and above what, what they had before the pre-crisis. And this is excellent for those brands. But uh, in, uh, in general, if we look at uh, the overall recovery, what we are seeing is that uh, after two months, we are basically at levels of 80, 70 to 80 percent of before the, uh, uh, before the COVID crisis. If we uh, look at what is happening in this, these first few weeks of reopening uh, after, uh, after the lockdown in, uh, in key European cities, uh, we are seeing that in, in, uh, in destinations like shopping malls, which in Europe tend to be more in the suburbs, uh, uh, there we are quite quickly back to 70 to 80 percent uh, footfall compared to uh, the pre, let's say, the pre-lockdown situation. While uh, uh, when we look at uh, shops which are located more in the downtown regions, uh, uh, there the situation is uh, more mixed with some stores which again are showing queues, but other stores where the footfall is uh, still quite limited. So this is the situation that is evolving because again most of these reopenings in Europe are very, very recent, but this is what we have gathered in terms of first, uh, of first, uh, of first uh, results. If we move to the next slide, uh, where we are looking a little bit about uh, the second phase, which is more uh, linked to uh, what we call the uh, intra-regional. Uh, uh, here, clearly, uh, uh, today the, the, the information that we have is quite limited because the only, let's say, intra-regional that has opened so far uh, is linked primarily to uh, 
uh, to what we define as cross-border scenario, which is particularly people that are going uh, very regularly to uh, to neighboring countries in order to do uh, uh, shopping for for their goods. This is not exactly the same dynamic as we will see with, uh, let's say, continental Europeans uh, going to London, but. Uh, uh, but still can provide uh, a sort of proxy and what we have seen is that recovery in that sector is uh, quite fast uh, and uh, as soon as uh, borders have opened for this kind of cross-border uh, consumption then we have seen uh, uh, that the volumes are picking up uh, quite, uh, quite, uh, quite quickly. Um, when will borders reopen for Europeans to go to the UK? Well, borders are probably reopening as we speak. Uh, today we have this limitation which is linked to the uh, quarantine that anybody visiting the UK would need to uh, do. So it's not a big incentive, but I'm sure that will be uh, solved uh, in, the, uh, in the next uh, few weeks or few months. After that, I think we can expect that Europeans will be back. Uh, and uh, maybe as a result of Brexit, there will be a new incentive if these uh, European consumers uh, are going to be able to shop tax-free uh, uh, on, uh, uh, on uh, when they are visiting uh, London. Thomas, can I just inter interrupt there? Um, carry on. Don't let this stop you, but we're not seeing your slides. We've got a technical problem uh, with regard to the slides, but uh, do carry on with your presentation. Uh, we can see you and we can hear you loud and clear. OK, OK. So um, maybe uh, I have covered in this first part what is domestic and what is, uh, let's say, cross-border or intra-regional. If we move to the next phase, which is uh, uh, really about uh, the restart of the long haul. We have taken a look at what are what were the key nationalities for the West End uh, in 2019 because we think it gives a good idea of what the starting point should be. So if we look at the numbers for 2019, we see that Greater China represented 30% of the sales of the tax-free shopping sales in the West End. Uh, the GCC countries represented uh, again almost 30%, followed by uh, other countries in Southeast Asia and the US representing uh, roughly 7%. Seven, 7%. So, uh, what is currently happening in, in you know, those large clusters which, are, which were very important in 2019 and we think will continue to be very important uh, as uh, travelers will start coming back? Uh, what is currently happening with those uh, uh, large clusters. So if we, if we look at uh, uh, Greater China today, the situation is that, uh, uh, you know, uh, the country has been uh, uh, quite restrictive in terms of uh, uh, incentivizing uh, consumers to, uh, to, uh, uh, to fly overseas, particularly in terms of long haul. There are still a significant number of visa centers which are closed. Uh, so, uh, capability for, for uh, let's say, regular travelers from China to travel abroad, if we leave aside for a second, even the intention to do that uh, is quite uh, uh, limited, uh, as is the, uh, uh, the, basically the capability that is provided by airlines. There has been a significant uh, restriction in terms of the number of uh, routes and the number of flights. Uh, going uh, from China to uh, to overseas, but we are already seeing some encouraging signs in terms of uh, more flexibility uh, and more routes uh, being uh, authorized by uh, the, 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 the Chinese authorities. So we think that capacity will start uh, uh, building uh, uh, over time. When it comes to the GCC countries, uh, we are seeing uh, very, uh, I would say, proactive uh, uh, initiatives from the main uh, airlines in terms of reinstating destinations and reinstating flights and reinstating capacity. So, uh, from the point of view of uh, 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 residents in GCC countries being able to travel uh, to London, we think that uh, that is probably going to happen uh, quite fastly because, again, from the point of view of the airlines, there is a very, very strong push, both from Emirates and from Qatar, uh, in terms of trying to uh, reopen as quickly as possible that capability. So, 
uh, we think this is probably the, the, the one of the origin markets that will recover faster in terms of uh, uh, you know people being uh, again visiting uh, you know uh, destinations uh, and, and uh, you know uh, visiting your boutiques. Uh, are they uh, going to recover full very quickly? Well, that's a question mark also because we have seen in the past that when oil prices are uh, are depressed like they are today, that has an impact on uh, on, on on the overall spending by this type of traveler. So uh, uh, maybe they will not get back immediately to uh, the same volume of people and the same volume of spend that we had before. But in terms of uh, uh, arrivals, we think this is one of the nationalities that will uh, first uh, uh, start showing up uh, in, in, in your stores and in your destinations. When, we, when it comes to the US, uh, we're all aware of the situation there, uh, but in terms, so in terms of traveling today, uh, quite uh, complex, but from the point of view of airline capacity, again, some initial mild signals coming from, uh, from airlines uh, announcing plans to start to uh, reinstate capacity uh, from July onwards uh, and we are uh, fairly confident that uh, there also the capability for American travelers to visit uh, London will uh, will uh, gradually uh, pick up and recover also because it's uh, it's a very important uh, uh, um, let's say route from a from a business perspective what the impact of the, um, uh, let's say, the, the economic uh, crisis that is linked to the virus will be on, on, uh, uh, on the number and the purchasing powers of US consumers. This is something that we will continue to monitor because, uh, as I mentioned before, we think the capacity will be uh, uh, gradually reinstated, but uh, maybe there will be, uh, compared to at least to 2019, there will be uh, less people with uh, the capacity and the intent to travel. But again, this is something that will uh, evolve over time. So, uh, in general, I would say that uh, we are uh, very confident that the recovery uh, will take place and at one point in time we will be back to volumes which are similar to what we were seeing until 2019. But uh, when uh, that will happen and how quickly that will happen will be different depending on uh, uh, the origin country and it will also depend significantly in terms of border reopening and uh, the capacity that is made available and the sanitary measures and these kind of things. Um, the next section of my uh, of my presentation is uh, around uh, shopper sentiments. So, so as I was mentioning at the beginning, we have done this uh, uh, survey. You know, just uh, fresh out of the oven, we completed the survey ten days ago, and now we have processed the results. So, like I mentioned at the beginning, we reached out to almost seven thousand. Uh, Chinese travelers that uh, have been uh, uh, shopping in London and in other key uh, destinations in Europe during 2019 uh, and that have spent at least 3,000 euros during the last uh, 24 months. So a very specific group of consumers. It doesn't represent the entirety uh, of, uh, of, uh, uh, of Chinese travelers, but they are very meaningful from the point of view of the fact that they are uh, experienced shoppers that have been in Europe uh, uh, recently. And we ask them a number of questions. So if we go to the next slide, the first thing that we ask them, and you know, uh, uh, please bear in mind, we asked them in May whether they would prepare to travel in June. Uh, and the reality is that we got, uh, uh, you know, answers which are, uh, I think, very reasonable, which is basically in this moment to think that already next month, or already 30 days from now, to entertain uh, an overseas travel is is uh, today not uh, a priority for the majority of these consumers that we have uh, that we have surveyed but we are also sure that this uh, sentiment will evolve over time as the sanitary situation uh, not only in china but now more in destination countries is uh, uh, is is evolving we have always we have also asked these consumers about their perception on the different destinations, and again, not surprisingly, there is a wide gap between their uh, understanding of or their perception about how safe uh, 
destinations in Asia Pacific are compared to destinations in Europe. So uh, if you look at the chart, uh, destinations like Singapore or Japan or Korea are uh, uh, generally perceived as uh, you know, being safe or neutral with still a significant uh, number of the respondents saying that, you know, 40 to 50 percent saying that they perceive they are unsafe. When we look at destinations in Europe, uh, unfortunately, the perception of unsafety is the vast majority. So if we look at destinations like Italy or Spain or France or the UK, more than 80 percent of respondents feel that it would be unsafe for them to travel to these destinations today, Germany being the exception. But again, this is a survey which is done in the moment in which when you read the news and when you look at uh, possible destinations that you would like to travel, all our countries are, uh, you know, just coming out of uh, coming out of lockdown. So again, we are confident and this is the reason why this survey we're going to do an update on a monthly basis. The perception of these consumers around traveling to Asia, but also about traveling to Europe, we are convinced it is something that is going to evolve uh, uh, over time. If we look at the next slide, uh, we basically ask consumers uh, when they would uh, consider the possibility of uh, uh, traveling internationally. Uh, and uh, uh, you, you, you see in your screens that for the remainder of 2020, there is uh, uh, some expectation that some travelers uh, uh, will uh, return. Uh, but uh, I would say that the, 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 the key moment is going to be for Chinese consumers is going to be uh, New Year in 2021, where today a lot of people are looking forward to that being the moment in which uh, uh, they would be first uh, uh, traveling uh, overseas. If we look at the data, we basically see that 70% of consumers expect that they would, they would do their next uh, international trip within the next 12 months up to spring of uh, of uh, 2021. Among the reasons why people are not keen to travel uh, uh, immediately, like I was mentioning before, uh, uh, the vast majority of the people that are not prepared to travel immediately are reluctant to do so because of uh, health concerns. Uh, but there is also uh, 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 a portion of the consumers that uh, today are uh, a bit concerned about their financial situation and therefore uh, would would argue that this is not the right time to travel for uh, for those reasons. As both the sanitary situation evolves and uh, 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 for uh, Chinese consumers, the, the, the financial impact, which uh, we think has be is quite limited, has become clear, then again, we, we see this evolving positively going forward. If we go to the next slide, uh, the next question that we have asked is, uh, you know, when you when the next time you travel and compared to what you have done uh, last year, do you expect to do, uh, uh, you know, uh, more shopping, more dining, more sightseeing or less or the same as uh, as before? And uh, uh, clearly in this moment, all consumers are uh, basically saying, uh, uh, that in general, if we look at the percentages, there will be a bit less activity for all these sectors than what there was before. Uh, but uh, particularly when it comes to shopping, we see a bigger percentage of people that are basically saying this will have no impact and I will continue. Uh, so 60% of respondents saying I will basically continue shopping uh, as much as I did before or uh, uh, more than I did before. While for activities, like dining or sightseeing today, the majority uh, is basically answering that they would not do that at all or they would do less than before. Again, this is uh, something that will probably evolve over time, but today when we do a snapshot of Chinese consumers and their sentiment about what they would do uh, on their next overseas travel, this is the, uh, the answers that they are giving us. If we move to the next slide, uh, basically, we have also asked uh, consumers, you know, uh, if we look at uh, different retail formats that are available, uh, of course, in London, but in, 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 in all major cities, uh, will there be any significant shift uh, uh, in terms of the type of retail format that they prefer? So we have to ask them about boutiques, about, uh, uh, you know, shopping villages, department stores. 
and uh, shopping malls and uh, uh, based on the data that these consumers have provided back we expect that uh, there will be a preference for those formats where the traffic or the footfall is more limited uh, compared to those kinds of uh, retailer format where there is likely to be more aggregation uh, of consumers so typically looking at, at the figures that we're share that we are displaying here uh, you know boutiques uh, in, in 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 places like uh, the west end or downtown would would be preferred uh, in a certain sense over uh, shopping malls or over villages or uh, over uh, department stores so this is what chinese consumers are uh, are basically telling us through this survey if we move to the next slide and i think i'm uh, getting here to the end we have also asked consumers okay so now uh, uh, next time you travel you're going to be visiting you know uh, stores of different format what what do you expect how do you think brands should be uh, uh, what what do you think brands should be doing in order to make uh, you know the, the shopping experience uh, better for you as a consumer and we we basically prompted a number of uh, uh, measures uh, linked primarily to health and to social distancing and you know most of them uh, came up as being very relevant for Chinese consumers with the, the, the most critical ones being the fact that uh, all staff should be wearing uh, face masks and making uh, antiviral products available for consumers, limit the number of uh, uh, people that you are serving simultaneously to ensure that uh, you know items are proper, pro properly cleaned after they have been uh, tried. Uh, and then some uh, uh, some more elements around uh, you know things like uh, being able to manage queues or to be able to book appointments or to eventually uh, uh, implement uh, click and collect or click and deliver mechanisms that can allow consumers to uh, uh, to uh, not have to visit the store or to visit the store uh, uh, for, for a very limited period of time. So again, this is something which is likely to evolve over time. But today, if we have to give uh, uh, a recommendation to brands, which is not a recommendation from Global Blue, but simply a digestion, which is coming from uh, the information that consumers are telling us, it is clear that all the elements around health and social distancing are in this moment very, very important for those consumers. So, you know, brands should be prepared to ensure that in the experience that they provide consumers in store, these topics are addressed because they're very, very important for, uh, for uh, international shoppers. And with that, I think from my side, uh, I have a kind of uh, conclusion slide, which is uh, uh, um, uh, basically, I think, quite straightforward. The first one is like, uh, like I was mentioning at the beginning, there are uh, many external factors which are outside of the control of brands or, or, or in general uh, 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 businesses that are operating in the West End because they are linked to borders opening, they are linked to airline capacity, they are linked to evolution of health elements. But all those things are changing uh, uh, quite uh, rapidly and they will all have an impact in terms of how quickly and how strongly uh, the recovery is taking place. So, you know, the, 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 the basic advice there is that, uh, uh, of course, by, by actively monitoring uh, uh, how these external factors are evolving, uh, it can help anticipate and prepare uh, for, uh, for how things will, will, will happen and will reflect on your stores. And there, of course, there are a, a, a lot of sources of information uh, one which uh, I uh, offer is basically we have a page on LinkedIn where you know we're regularly publishing uh, updates and uh, where we are holding uh, conferences like uh, sharing the data that I've been sharing today. The second one is that clearly everything that is linked to uh, health uh, and safety and social distancing is uh, something that uh, international shoppers, particularly the ones from China, are going to be extremely sensitive about. So, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, all these factors should be taken into consideration uh, and they are, in our view, essential to guarantee that uh, shoppers will be feeling 
comfortable uh, and uh, you know willing to uh, to spend time in your stores and to buy goods uh, and therefore they should be uh, a relevant element uh, when you are defining the experience in your stores irrespective of whatever are you know government regulations or or you know mandatory aspects so that's it from my side. Thank you very much. And I'm uh, looking forward to answering any question you may have in the Q&A session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thomas. And uh, as you mentioned, there will be returning to you very shortly. Uh, just apologies again, because we did lose uh, the slides. We had one or two technical problems. Uh, if you want to have a look at those slides, my understanding is that we will be making them available uh, to you. And I would go to the LinkedIn page for the new West End company. Uh, give us a little uh, time to get them up but they should be there later on today, uh, certainly by tomorrow. So time now to hear from our second speaker, who is Ewan Venter, Chief Executive at Fortnum & Mason. He'll be telling us about his experience of reopening their store in Asia. And uh, as we've mentioned already, there will be a question and answer session. You can start putting those questions to both Thomas and Ewan right now by clicking on the question mark icon at the bottom of your webinar window right now. But for now, uh, let's cross over to Ewan and hear from you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, thank you for uh, inviting me along to speak. Um, I thought Thomas's presentation was hugely interesting. It was interesting the slide about where consumers might shop. I think I have a prediction that department store business in London will do very well in the recovery. I think the likes of Fenix and Self Juice, where there's a lot, a lot of space for consumers to move around, uh, uh, will give com confidence to consumers. Um, but turning to Asia, um, I suppose. It's important to understand the context, really. Fortnum's opened a store and a restaurant, um, restaurant called 181, in Hong Kong in November 2019. Um, that too was a very difficult time due to the protests and the general civil unrest. I, I recall that the night before we opened our store, there was literally rioting in about one street away, which gave us um, uh, lots of palpitations about physically opening the doors the very next day. But despite that, we managed to open um, and, you know, the, the basis of a very solid business started to emerge, both in retail, people coming in, buying lots of gorgeous, delightful um, foods and joy giving gifts, but also the restaurant started to perform um, very well. Naturally, however, due to the ongoing unrest um, and the lack of mainland Chinese tourists, footfall was, of course, lower than we had planned, but the signs were still very positive. Uh, January uh, 23rd, uh, 2020, Hong Kong reported its first case of COVID-19. Border restrictions uh, were quickly uh, implemented, quarantining, uh, isolating and so on. Schools closed towards the end of February and of course have just uh, reopened. Surprisingly, however, you know, Hong Kong um, up to this point have only reported four deaths and just um, 1,108 cases of uh, positive COVID-19. So, you know, unlike in the UK, um, their rapid behavioural change has meant that at no point had we, uh, did we need to close the store or indeed the restaurant. Now, during the peak of the outbreak, uh, our footfall um, uh, plummeted, um, it dropped by over 50% uh, on the pre-COVID, but uh, but, but the, the, the crisis of, of the, the, you know, the, the protests, etc. So we weren't, um, uh, at that point, we were operating on about 25% of where we envisaged our business plan to be. Um, but, you know, um, what's been extraordinarily interesting is, is that with that footfall, as uh, the pandemic started to uh, reduce in Hong Kong and the number of cases started to uh, to drop, uh, we started to be very evidently seeing a much sort of clearer uh, growth back to, to, to a normalised sales level as people started to have confidence. And, you know, that's the thing that I always think is, is really, really important is that, you, you know, above all, we've got to give, uh, you know, absolute confidence uh, to consumers, both uh, in Hong Kong, as we did, and, and here in the UK. So how did we do, how did we actually you know, do that and how did consumers respond? Well, you know, much like here, many of the Hong Kong locals were stocking up on essentials. You know, they were not necessarily for forums, of course, but they were, you know, buying masks and sanitizers and wipes and so on and so forth. I guess they had experience in Hong Kong from the SARS uh, uh, epidemic 
um, meant that the consumer in that environment were very reactive to government advice to remain at home and work from uh, work from home where they can. Border controls, you know, were you know not this sort of nonsense that's been going on here. Um, school closures, people got with it. Um, an immediate demand for e-commerce delivery services. Um, it was natural not to be in a food store to be offering products to taste because people just didn't wouldn't wouldn't indulge in that, you know. And 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 so we were. Uh, there was an ex, you know, there was just a way of working which was very good. We also witnessed um, a lot of job insecurity. So purchasing power absolutely dropped as people focused on the necessities. And when people did dine out, they were dining out for very high in very high quality restaurants and restaurants that demonstrated very stringent hygiene reassurance. Um, otherwise, they were, I imagine, returning, uh, reverting to you know takeaway and, and food deliveries. But we've seen a steady recover, as I've said, both across hospitality and retail. And as in the UK, several occasions like Easter and Mother's Day were significant. So people were buying into those events. Um, the, these occasions fell as weather perhaps improved and, and the stability of, of, of new COVID cases. Families were keen to get back uh, outside and spend together. And we fared well on all of these occasions. You know, for example, on Mother's Day, we sold out two weeks in advance in our restaurant for all the various bookings. Um, in Hong Kong, it's important to just emphasize 95% of our customers are indeed locals because there is simply no tourism. Um, and so we very much had to be agile in adjusting our marketing or communicating uh, communications activities to, to drive uh, the fact that uh, we, we were there to appeal to, to, to local consumers. Much the same challenge, I think, here in the UK in the coming months. So the measures we put in place, well, the single most important thing was, was the safety and well-being of our teams and guests. Um, so we deployed extra cleaning routines, masks, social distancing measures, um, but on a much lighter basis. So, for example, in our store, um, every member of uh, every member staff and all customers are required to wear masks. We temperature check all of our customers as they come in, in the store. We make sure that there's a high uh, frequency of visible cleaning at every touch point. Um, we are making sure that there's lots of hand sanitizer stations available, all about driving uh, this idea of, of confidence that they're coming into a safe space. Social distancing, as the, we understand it here in the UK, was only applied in the restaurant environment in Hong Kong, where 1.5 metres of space was, was to be left between tables, with no more than four people uh, per booking, uh, although that's now since been relaxed in early May to now eight people. We restricted our trading hours mostly, actually not in the restaurant, interestingly. We, what we witnessed in the restaurant environment is that when people came out to make that special occasion, they wanted to sit, linger, often spend more. You'd see the average spend go up, you'd see better quality wines uh, being sold and the like. So we've, we've uh, the, the, the big fact was really about putting our team's welfare and safety first. And of course, to our customers, and that for me, you know, has been, you know, the overwhelming thing that we 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 saw in Hong Kong, and we were able to then really be very nimble and very clear that 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 was the approach that we had to take when we reopened our Piccadilly store on uh, May the twenty first. Um, I mean, many of you will be aware. I mean, you know, reduced opening hours, changing shift to staff patterns to to allow people to come in at different times, and in order to also uh, avoid, uh, you know, overcrowding on uh, on public transport systems, giving people uh, peace of mind, uh, carrying out risk assessments, uh, sending employees uh, face coverings in advance, or demonstrating how they should go about uh, creating a face covering in order to make their journey to work. Um, safe and well. Um, it's really, uh, you know, it's made planning uh, challenging. However, you know, rather than uh, I think that, uh, you know, thinking about how reactionary Hong Kong was and how we've applied that knowledge to here, you know, rather than waiting to be told the guidance, we've, you know, we've, we've applied a healthy dose of thought, you know, being very thoughtful in every single thing that we've done. You know, making sure that the executive uh, board, the executive team were, you know, discussing, debating and deciding on a daily basis, the really open lines of communication to make sure that we were making all of the reassuring steps that our employees and, of course, our customers would expect. 
so as I touched on, we, we got our food business reopened um, uh, in Piccadilly on May the 21st. We set ourselves five conditions that we met. Um, and unlike some others, we really did meet them. Uh, so we knew that the time was right. And then we simply listened to our teams again, made sure that screens were in place, changing layouts, taking fixtures out, uh, you know, creating lots of uh, lots of uh, appropriate point of sale. I mean, I think horrendously we've applied I think nearly two and a half thousand pieces of point of sale in in our Piccadilly store, and the reaction has been fantastic. So you know, really, really positive. And uh, we've had customers coming in, clapping us uh, for thanks. We've had some of the great chefs, Angela Hartnett to Richard Corrigan, all coming in to see what's on and 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 uh, tucking into lots of uh, you know local fresh food um, uh, produce. So really thinking about you know the main differences between Hong Kong and and London in terms of opening you know fundamentally the key difference is that you know we're still subject to lots of uncertainty and so we've just got to do the right thing by our customers and by our staff. You, we've got to act with absolute integrity in everything that we do. Um, and then and then you know as I I was asked to comment you know on the, the immediate and one set one minute and then I'm I'm wrapped up really but I was asked to comment on the sort of how do I feel about um, the immediate trading opportunity, you know, between the international spend and, and uh, tourism and, and domestic? Well, you know, one of the strategies that we've deployed at Fortnum so for the last seven years has been to reduce our dependency on international tourism. You know, when I took on uh, the role of CEO, 60% of our business was international. Today, 60% of our business is domestic. So that's good news, certainly, for, from our perspective. But we do need to pull. I mean, that's a fact. Um, and uh, I think we need to be pushing hard on, you know, the rise of hopefully UK staycationing. You know, people will, I hope, um, stay at home this summer and be encouraged to spend their pound on uh, out and about in all parts of the United Kingdom. Hopefully more people will come to London on a significant day out or a, or a weekend. We are marketing to people the idea of the reunion afternoon tea so how are you going to reunion with your friends and family and do something with a bit of style and we've got that underway i hope Sunday trading laws are relaxed i believe that's likely to happen i think that will be of benefit uh, we are very keen to get hospitality back up and running safely we're very keen in the west end to see our cultural institutions open because without our museums and galleries i think the west end is um, uh, increasingly more challenged but on a practical level, people need to feel safe and, and there needs to be good, clean uh, modes of transport. At the core, I think it comes down to one thing. We must do everything in our power to make people feel more confident. Confident that they can travel safely, confident that they can shop safely, and confident that, uh, in Fortland's case, that the sparkling tea, the Glen Arms steak, or the afternoon tea, or indeed the tackles in 45 German Street, are really worth travelling for. Thank you. Thank you very much, you and I, for one, I'm looking forward to afternoon tea at Fortnum and Masons as soon as uh, uh, as I can get round to it. Um, just a reminder, we do want your questions, but all you need to do is click on the question mark icon at the bottom of the webinar window. Particularly interested, I've got lots and lots of questions for Thomas because obviously he went first. If we could have a few more questions for you and I know they're out there, it would be good to have them. But let's kick off with a question to Thomas. Uh, which are the countries that you feel will be most important in the recovery phase from the international traveller point of view? So, so like I was mentioning a little bit before, uh, I think that the different countries will recover at different speeds. So typically today, if we if we if we had to say based on uh, based on what looks like uh, uh, almost immediate increase of capacity, probably uh, Middle Eastern countries are, are among the first that we will see back into London uh, in terms of traveler numbers. We do have a question mark around uh, uh, their spend because, uh, again, as I was mentioning, you know, we have seen in the past for Middle Eastern and for Russian travelers that uh, oil price has an impact on uh, uh, on uh, uh, on the currency, and the currency then has a you know almost direct correlation with. Uh, uh, with uh, with actual spending behavior, but in terms of how quickly they will recover, we think that probably uh, because uh, because of the, the the strong push, particularly from the airlines, to open these routes very quickly, we think we are you know quite 
uh, keen to to think that they will be among the first to be back uh, in in in, uh, in London. Uh, for the for the Chinese, we are again super confident in the in the in the long term. Probably the the, the key moment will be, uh, uh, like I was mentioning before, is going to be around Chinese New Year of next year. But uh, uh, I th we think that uh, Chinese consumers will continue to be extremely sensitive to uh, the health and the safety issues. So it will depend a lot. Uh, on how quickly uh, this uh, uh, perception that I was showing in one of these slides, where today you know destinations in Europe, including the UK, are perceived as you know not being the safest from the point of view of the virus, how quickly that perception can be overcome. Once that is overcome, then uh, we think the uh, you know the recovery of the Chinese is is probably going to be uh, gradual, uh, but it will uh, it will eventually get back to uh, to the levels that we were having uh, pre pre virus. So uh, this is a little bit among the two the two uh, key groups, which as I was mentioning before, used to represent 30% each of the uh, of the shopping business in uh, in the West End. Uh, we see different trends. Uh, in terms of timing and in terms of intensity of the recovery. Let's hope that uh, perception is changed as quickly as possible. Um, uh, thank you for that. Let's uh, go to a question from Jill. Uh, this is a question for Ewan. Uh, based on your experience in Hong Kong and London, what difference would it make to reduce social distancing from two metres to one metre? Uh, well, great question. I think it will make every difference. Uh, statistically, in our restaurants, we I think can add it's about another 18% of our covers, the difference between, um, actually no, tell a lie, it's between 18% of our covers improvement to one and a half metres, and then it goes to about 23% or yeah, about 23, 24% more by going down to one metre. So it has a dramatic impact to our ability on number of covers in our restaurants. Um, in terms of the store, um, you know, at this time of year, it, I don't think it matters so much. But when we do our forward planning for the high days and holidays, and in particular as we get into quarter four of the calendar year, you know, the all important Christmas trading period, it is a disaster financially to carry on running a retail business on two meters. Really, really tough. So. Um, uh, you know, I think I think you know it's it's well documented that the government are are reassessing uh, whether in the very short term they can see a move from from two to one. Uh, but one we can really hope that by the time we get to the autumn period, um, we we can get to one meter, if not less. And my understanding, there's an awful lot of pressure on the Conservative backbenchers for that uh, uh, distance of two metres uh, to be reduced to one. So it'll be an interesting to watch in, in the coming uh, few weeks. Let's uh, go to a question uh, for Thomas. Have you conducted any research regarding Middle Eastern consumer intentions regarding a return to London and shopping as soon as the months of July, August and September, assuming quarantine is lifted? That question to Thomas. So, so the, the, we, we have conducted this first, first wave in May with Chinese consumers and now we have a, in our pipeline to conduct uh, during uh, the months of June, July and August for Middle Easterns and for Russians. Uh, 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 so, you know, we will, we will ask basically the same questions around sentiment and we will ask the same questions around what they expect to find. So, you know, we will be happy to share that data as soon as we have it available in the coming months. OK, question here uh, for Ewan. Um, I know you touched on this when you were speaking, Ewan, but I think it would be just really interesting if you could unpack it a little bit more. The question is, how did Fortnum and Mason shift their clients from foreign to local? <laughs> that's, a, that's not a COVID related question, is it? Um, well, I could consult on the subject at great expense, you know. Uh, yeah, because some of them is, uh, <laughs> secrets for free with us now, please. Uh, yeah, exactly. Um, well, it's a, I mean, we've always talked about as a as a business about being more relevant to more people more often, and uh, you know, the secret to the team success, and it is a team success that um, you know we 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 took the brand to places that were least expected within the domestic market. 
And, you know, eight years ago, 2012, you know, we were popping up at the Port Elliot Music and Cultural Festival. We were doing afternoon tea in the middle of Hyde Park. We took the bits to the top of the uh, uh, to the top of the um, shard and did a whole summer of afternoon tea. So we, we did lots of unexpected activities that appeal to the domestic consumer and reminded people that in our 312 year history, we've always been there for Londoners. We've always been there by Londoners. I mean, you know, central London and around London. Um, and um, and, I, and, I, and that was, that was a, certainly a, a key catalyst in the, uh, the beginning of changing the metrics. But, you know, Fortnum's has always been there, you know, for 300 and something years, 12 years, you know, as that, that, that gourmet place to go and buy your, your, you know, fabulous treats and fabulous uh, essential items. So, yeah, I mean, that, that was the beginning of, of, of how that process worked. It's interesting. I wonder, I, I have been rediscovering my local neighbourhood in London and uh, on the walks that I've been taking and I wonder whether lots of Londoners uh, like myself who've lived in London all of their adult lives will rediscover uh, stores like yours as a, this fantastic thing that we have on our doorstep and we perhaps haven't visited as often as we should have done uh, and this might be the trigger to get us uh, back through the doors and to help kick start uh, the economy in the West End. Um, there's a question. And I think, I think, I think just, what, just to build on that point just very briefly but you know our web business our online waterwaste.com business during this period you know has increased sixfold uh, and all driven well mostly driven by domestic consumers across the uk but i think that's really strong brand evidence that in this period where you couldn't get to the store um consumers bought from our digital and they bought they bought beef, they bought lamb, they bought cheese, they bought smoked salmon, you know, as well as tea and biscuits and jam. So, you know, it was, it was, it's been quite heartening to see the brand loyalty during this period. Yeah, absolutely. Let's cross to a question uh, from Paul to Thomas. Do you get any feeling from China of changing sentiment about visiting the UK because of diplomatic issues? i.e. e.g. COVID-19 inquiry and of course the situation in Hong Kong? So to be honest, we have not been that granular in our research, uh, but uh, probably it's one of the elements that we want to include in further uh, waves of our of our, uh, of our surveys because uh, reality is that uh, that can in itself have also uh, an impact in terms of uh, timeline. Uh, uh, we have seen in the past that uh, you know diplomatic tensions can lead to uh, you know an impact which is either coming from an open recommendation uh, not to travel to certain countries to a not open but uh, let's say uh, still practical feeling around uh, you know i don't want to travel to this particular destination because i don't like uh, the way this country is managing the relationship with China. So uh, definitely it is a, it is a point uh, to monitor and uh, we will uh, look to get more information around that in our next waves of surveys because we, we agree with, uh, with Paul, this is a topic which is uh, sensitive and important. Okay, let's um, return to Ewan. Uh, the question here from some of them. Okay. Uh, but it is this, assuming people feel safe to return, how maintaining or reimagining the magic of the Fortnum experience? Well, I think, I mean, that's a great question. And of course, everybody's, everybody's talking about that. But uh, we're doing it already. Our customers are telling us that, you know, just the, the sheer access to the store and to a very motivated, very happy team uh, engaging with people, giving good quality service, um, you know, it, part of our part of our, our joy and our experience is all about the product, and uh, and, and and obviously the way that we were we're served. You know, I, I I can't I must admit I can't wait to get the restaurants open because I really think that uh, in our case and in many cases, you know, restaurants offer you know that tremendous sense of conviviality and hospitality in the wider sense, you know, of sharing and and engaging and. And, and so the store, I think, is great and I think it's fine, but I think getting the restaurants open is a very important part of our brand experience. And that's why I, I'm, you know, I'm every, every opportunity I have to lobby 
uh, anyone that cares to listen that getting this, the, the two meter rule to one meter, I think is a really important part of, uh, of that brand experience. So um, July the 4th or earlier, I think July the 4th is the date where we're working to. We've actually opened the booking line for two of our restaurants, 45 German Street and the, the Diamond Jubilee Tea Salon from the 4th. And we've already been inundated with, with demand. So I think our customers are telling us that they're looking forward to it. Just time for a couple more questions. This one uh, to Thomas from Lucy. Uh, when was the survey done? I wonder if Japan now feels less safe and I'm surprised that France is seen as less safe than the UK. I noticed that uh, point as well, Lucy. Uh, what would be your response, Thomas? So this survey was done uh, during the month of May. Uh, the questions were sent around mid-May uh, and the answers were there, then collected uh, during the, the following week. Uh, so this is the, this is the timing when the questions were were uh, uh, were, were managed. Uh, I, I I think that the the you know the data shows that the perception is almost identical between uh, you know Paris and uh, uh, or let's say France and the UK, uh, with the only let's say strange exception among European uh, countries of Germany. Uh, then for the rest, I think, you know, the order of magnitude of the difference between uh, uh, UK, France, uh, Italy and Spain is uh, minimal. And, you know, it reflects the fact that all these destinations uh, at that point were, uh, you know, uh, probably at the peak or just getting out of the peak in terms of uh, the number of people getting sick, the number of people, unfortunately, uh, dying in many cases uh, still uh, uh, in lockdown in terms of commercial activity. So uh, uh, the, the the landscape of all these countries looked uh, uh, pretty similar, even living living in Europe. Uh, and so I'm I'm personally not surprised that they look quite similar uh, for people living in China. I think we are going to have to leave it uh, there. Time is uh, creeping up on us, but thank you to both Thomas and Ewan for joining us today. And thank you to you for joining and thank you for your questions. Next week, we are going local and welcoming Councillor Rachel Robotham, uh, leader of Westminster City Council. She'll be taking us through what the council is doing to help with reopening and recovery and what their longer term aims are for the West End. Join us. Bye and keep safe.